Hi, welcome to the signal path. In this episode, we're going to take a look at an electromechanical attenuator. May not sound so exciting, but this particular one works from DC to 70 gigahertz and it has 75 dB of controllable attenuation. We've looked at electromechanical attenuators on the channel before, but this is by far the highest frequency one we're going to take apart. There are not that many companies that can make electromechanical attenuators like this up to these frequencies. Keysight, of course, makes them up to 110 gigahertz because it goes into the front end of their spectrum analyzers and oscilloscopes. And I think Roden Schwartz makes them at least up to 90 gigahertz or so. A while back, Roden Schwartz used to buy the electromechanical attenuators from Onritsu. Whenever we opened one of their older spectrum analyzers, we saw that. But now they make their own, especially as your needs grow, you just may not simply be able to buy them, especially from your competitor. So this is going to be really interesting to see. This one has two paths and one, that's probably for some calibration when it's inside the instrument. So I'm really eager to see what it looks like on the inside. The dangers of these is that if you pick up an instrument that works up to 70 gigahertz and you're measuring something at one gigahertz, it's really easy to overload the attenuators because they can only take one watt maximum in this particular one. So you can imagine you will destroy it. And I think this is probably what has happened to this one. So let's take a look. And with the main cover off, we can see the architecture of the electromechanical attenuator. This particular one has one, two, three, four, five particular solenoids. This last one is most likely a switch for the path selection, which we will see when we take it apart a little bit more. All of our drivers are here. There's no problem with these. This problem is mostly from the attenuator pads themselves. Internally, they are broken. So once we take them apart, we will find out. I wonder if this marking means that that particular one is dead. We have to take it apart. A lot of screws over here. This is very difficult to take apart. You shouldn't just take all the screws off in any order you want because the interfaces of the coaxes to the attenuator as well as the plate to the pads is very, very precise. And talk about over engineering, there is a Xilinx FPGA inside of the electromechanical attenuator. You can see it through here. I wonder why they have that. Perhaps for some automated thing? I'm not sure, but man, there's a lot of components on this. So let's think about the operation of this attenuator in a bit more detail and appreciate why it is so difficult to make a 70 gigahertz broadband electromechanical attenuator. There are several problems we're dealing with. There's the attenuation itself, and then there's maintaining a good coaxial response, having a good phase and frequency response across this entire broadband range. So we're basically trying to move a conductor. If you look at these solenoids, when you move them, these solenoids are coupled to these really thin pieces of plastic that are moving that copper around. There's a copper tape in there. It's very, very thin, and here it's flexible, so you can move it around depending on how this solenoid is positioned. So in this case, we actually have a selector. We have the path coming from the top, which is right now selected. If this solenoid switches down, then this path is selected. This is basically a calibration path. It's much lower frequency. It doesn't have the V connector. This is a K connector. So it allows you to inject some signal, and it goes all the way through. And then this is going to meet the first mixer inside the spectrum analyzer. And that's how you're going to calibrate this attenuator as well as the response of the mixer. When the solenoid is the other position, we're basically taking the signal from the input from the user, and then that goes through the attenuation, and it makes it all the way to the mixer as well. So that's why you have this unusual situation in the front. Everywhere else, you're selecting between the attenuator path and a through path. So there's a piece of copper tape right there too. If I push this forward, now we're in zero dB attenuation. When I push it down, we're going to be going through this pad. This is probably the smallest pad we've seen in an electromechanical attenuator to date. And this is probably because this is such a high frequency, they have to make these pads quite a bit smaller to maintain the good characteristic over the right wide frequency range with the lower parasitics. At the same time, the power handling of these pads is going to be considerably worse than some of the lower frequency attenuators. So as we switch this back and forth, you can see these pist pistons move up and down and move that trace back and forth. So that's the first problem, getting all these alignments and everything and making sure that the attenuator pads are broadband response. But then the second problem is you're trying to move a conductor inside a metal cavity and you want to preserve all the impedances across that movement. You don't want to have a different characteristic impedance as this thing is in this position or in this position. And if you look, the distance between that copper tape and the bottom floor, which is your RF ground, is really, really small. And as a result, when you put the top on, back on top of this, you're going to have a similar distance from this to the top of that. So the characteristic of this micro coax is going to be primarily determined by the distances and what is really close proximity. So you can design and engineer this with good tolerances to maintain a really nice 50 ohm. At the same time, they have covered the walls that are far away with an RF absorber. This prevents any cavity modes from developing in here. But these are too far to determine the impedance. The key is to make sure only what is really close to this line determines your coaxial mode, which is not easy to do, and it's, it's mostly an issue of tolerance in this case. And by having those tolerances, it essentially means that the surrounding environment of these 
micro lines that are running around are just the same no matter what position they have. So of course that means that you're going to have a good coaxial characteristic. It's like getting a cable and bending it a little bit. It's not going to make much of a difference. It looks really nice. There's these little spacers in there. I don't know what they're made of. They could be either ceramics or Teflons. They're just basically minimally there just to hold things around. Not so much of it. Even in here you can see some of them are half size perhaps because they were really really trying to optimize the impedance. The other challenge here is the interface and how do you go from this copper line into the center of this coax connector and this coax connector has uh, a cross opening around and you can push that into the cross really really tight very difficult to assemble so you have to be super careful taking these apart and that's how they reach that it's exactly the same on the other side really nice engineering and you can see there's even an o-ring around there to prevent anything from entering this cavity this has already been open and if you look carefully you see that this pad is missing it's actually broken this pad is missing this one is missing this one is not there there's one over there so everything else is basically gone i actually have them inside the little container it came with this someone has already taken this apart and trying to repair it now without those pads it's almost impossible you have to glue them in place very very carefully you also have to engineer it in such that every time you do this you get a really good contact between the surfaces of this so they have to have a good surface finish and there should be enough force just not too much to make sure that this can be done 100,000 times or more without failing. That's not easy neither, but this is a problem every attenuator faces. It's just that this is a much smaller surface area, so you're going to have even harder time to do that. Now you may ask, well, how has this failed? Well, there is a tiny, tiny bit of telltale sign on it. Let's see if we can catch it on camera. If you look carefully, I don't know if this is going to be possible to see here. So if I hold it around just at the right angle, you can see a little bit of a sign of some magic smoke having escaped. You can see the residue of the smoke a little bit around here. So somebody has overloaded this attenuator and has burned up that particular pad and everything else is either broken during this assembly or perhaps multiple of them have died. These kind of attenuators or any attenuator in front of a spectrum analyzer is a pretty critical component because by default there's always a 10 dB dialed in unless you manually remove that. So if you put too much signal in, hopefully you will kill the itinerary, not the really expensive following mixers. Not that this itinerary is cheap, it's not going to be cheap. But nonetheless, I think that's a good advantage to have. And there are overload detectors which then allow you to disconnect. For example, you could just completely disconnect this in the case of an overload condition, and you will have an open, nothing would happen in that case. And this is also common. Yeah, looks really good. The drivers are on this side, nothing unusual. But I do really want to see some of these under the microscope so we can see what those pads look like because I have them already anyway so we may as well take a look at them but this is a beautiful design now you may ask why do we have so many sections well that's just the number of attenuation pads so this 5 probably means this is a 5 dB you could have a 2, a 5, a 10, a 20 and a 40 for example and then you can combine them to get to pretty much any attenuation you want up to 70 or 80 which is what this is going to do and here are the attenuators under the microscope. Always amazing to see the quality of the picture that comes out of this instrument. So we're looking at three 20 dB attenuators actually. So I was mistaken to thinking that this had a 2 dB pad. It doesn't. It has three 20s, 110 and 15. And that adds up to a maximum of 75 and you can switch them with 5 dB steps. That's how this thing works. So we have all three 20s in here and they're all unfortunately broken because they're really hard to get out of the chassis itself. So whoever disassembled it cracked them while they were trying to take it out. This is the ground pad right over here and there's another ground pad at the top and that's the part that's broken on this particular one. And in the middle you have some deposit resistors, some thin film resistors of some kind. And this is a pi network that allows you to achieve the attenuation while maintaining a 50 ohm impedance. So the signal can come from left to the right, it doesn't matter, this is bidirectional. And then you do the resistive divider, maintaining 50 ohm and you get the attenuation. Actually on these it's written what the attenuation is. You can see right over here it says 20 dB, so this is a 20 dB pad, and on this one at the bottom you're looking at the same one just the other side. So there's two marks on this, this must be from factory probing, that's how they measure them, and then the place where the copper tape you saw inside the itinerary strikes the pad is right here on the left side, and on the other one you can see it strikes it right over here. So it architecturally is pretty straightforward, it's just very fine and these thin film resistors are not cheap, you know, obviously a semiconductor, quasi-semiconductor material deposition to get that going. Interesting to also see that there are holes in this to connect the two sides together. Looks like they're laser drilled and they melt and connect together or they might be sputtered afterwards. It may be that they punch those holes through this substrate which could be ceramic or something and then they uh, deposit the metal on top. So interesting manufacturing technique for sure. And here's the other 20 dB attenuator. You can see they all have suffered the same fate. They are all broken 
and then the 5db attenuator just like we suspected has been destroyed by some overload condition burnt up and cracked in the middle and we just saw the effect of that smoke ever so on inside of the unit when we take it apart and we can verify that this is indeed 5db no nope, not on this side there it is, 5dB here. So yeah, that's dead. And the 10dB itinerary is still inside the unit. And we saw that when we were taking it apart also. So the architecture of these things is now pretty obvious. It's a shame that this is destroyed. And now all of these pads need to actually be replaced. And even then, you have to glue them in place and align them. It's, it's quite delicate work. And this is not something you can buy off the shelf. Mm -hmm. You can also put it into a different lighting. You can see it a little bit better, the, the metalization and how these pads are connected. Yeah, very interesting. I can get a bit perhaps a better focus on this one so you can see the structures a bit better and then finally up here the destruction of the 5db pad yeah it's a shame but now we know a lot more learned a lot about how this is made very cool stuff and there you go i hope you enjoyed this if you want to support the channel you can do so through patreon or paypal the link is in the video description i really appreciate everyone who does support the channel you make all of this possible i have a couple of really interesting videos in the works so if you want to make sure you don't miss them subscribe to the channel i'll see you next time